<laughs> uh, tonight, we're, uh, we should be able to make it through 14, just so you kind of gear your minds towards that. So, how are you guys doing in the back, back there? Doing good? <laughs> so, uh, Psalms... Psalms chapter 10. Is anybody wondering what this, what's going on up here? That is going to be our baptismal for uh, our upcoming baptism. So it really is. It really is. Very industrial. Um, maybe we'll paint it up a little bit. But you know what? Uh, no, it'll work out. It's, uh, it's, all about, um, it's all about baptizing. It's not about what it's in or all that. It's about baptizing. That's what it's about. And it's about being obedient to the Lord. And it's about um, an opportunity to to do that in front of your peers and to proclaim the Lord and his death and his resurrection in your life. So anyway, with that, Psalm 10. We're going to pick it up. And uh, we'll try to make it through 14. We should be able to do that, no problem. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? So obviously uh, David here is experiencing a feeling of distance that the Lord, it's not as if he's gone, it's his experience of God is as if he's feeling like God's distant. So it's good to know that David experiences that, isn't it? Because we go through that too. And sometimes we think something's wrong, and sometimes it may be. Maybe it's us. Maybe we've moved from God. But other times, um, God, for his purposes, he allows us to walk by faith in the things that we know. And as we do that, we actually grow in our faith. And so we'll see that, that theme develop here a little bit. So he'll, he'll give the reason why he's feeling that. In verse 2, he says, The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. So he's, he's observing something that's really troubling to him. And the reason he's feeling that God is distant is because he wants God to change that. And so, you know, that, that question many people have is, you know, why does God allow suffering? And if there is a God, why do these things happen? So those are, those are normal thoughts to think. But we also have to, at some point, have faith in the sovereignty of God, meaning that He's in control, and understand that, that we're not God and our thoughts are not God thoughts. So that's where faith comes in, right? So as we see this develop, here's what we're going to be looking at. You know how in the book of Hebrews it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things, what? Not seen. That's what faith is. So here he's seen, he's seen stuff happen and yet it's troubling to him, and he's, he's saying, God, you're far off. Uh, you, you, there's the poor, and the way the poor are treated. And he's drawing out these contrasts, and he says there's a, there's a, a group of people now. He distinguishes, he, sa- he calls them the wicked. He said that the wicked, motivated by pride, they persecute the poor. So there, there are some active activities that wicked people do out of their pride that hurts the poor. And so he says, let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. So we don't know exactly what that is, but we can sort of start to think about and contextualize in our day and age and think about how poor people are often exploited and how people can have schemes and run schemes to 
take advantage of people and to do things out of their pride to get from them things that they don't already have. This is the mentality, sort of a, a very animal kingdom, dog-eat-dog dog sort of mentality where it's like a pecking order. And when a society begins to do that, that's a godless society. When a society begins to take advantage of the hurting, the poor, the innocent, the helpless, when they see the those who are not as strong and vibrant and energetic as those to be taken advantage of, or those who are insignificant, that's a wicked society. That's a wicked generation. So he's praying, let them be caught in their plots. It's disturbing to them and to him. In verse three, he says the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. So there's this arrogance about their humanistic desires for accumulation of power, prestige, money, whatever it is, position, all those things that represent the self-life, things that represent the lust of the flesh, the pride of life and the lust of the eye, all these things that represent a godless attitude. So he says, he blesses the greedy and renounces the poor. Oh, I'm sorry, renounces the Lord. So there we start to pick up something here. So their attitude towards other people is in direct contrast to their attitude towards the Lord. It's interesting how God changes our attitude about the needy, the innocent, the helpless, the hurting, the poor. When God begins to get a hold of our heart, we begin to get a big heart for people who need help. So he says, verse 4, the wicked, there it is again, the, this category of people, in his proud countenance, he does not seek God. And he says, God is in none of his thoughts. So now, this is interesting. So this is the, this is the revealing of the heart of, of a person, and then we can extend that out into a community or a nation that's godless. What happens is that godless person or nation, society, whatever it is, they begin to look at other people not in the way God looks at them. They don't value other people, but they begin to look at other people as objects to be able to get what they want out of their pride and out of the lust of their flesh. So a person who doesn't think about God, their thoughts are devoid of God, which, by the way, I've mentioned before, the word for lunatic originally meant a mind without God, lunatic. And here we get that sort of thing. It's it's, it's a separation or somebody who's rebelling against God's authority in their own life, so they're left to do their own thing. And, and that's where you start to get into more of an understanding of what's happening in our country. When we separate ourselves from God, which, by the way, our whole government and democracy and all that was was predicated upon personal responsibility, which was set up to have a personal responsibility because of a relationship that one would have with God. When that starts to break down, you know what happens, is our freedom is taken away. And you and I don't like that, do we? But society is always balancing out law and freedom. And you have to have more law when people are not responsible with their freedoms. Laws have to increase. Otherwise, society cannot maintain itself. And so you and I are sort of experiencing that. We don't like that. 
because without those imposing of laws externally because people internally are not able to govern themselves no self-control which is a fruit of the spirit well then now you have to have this heavy hand of control and that's what we're feeling he says in verse 5 he says speaking of the wicked his ways are always prospering that word uh, literally means grievous or twisted. What it means is this person always has an angle on their relationships with people, their dealings with people, their relationships with people are always self-centered. And because of that, and because they don't have accountability to God, then they're looking for an advantage to get an upper hand on an individual. And that's why uh, being in the business world sometimes can be very difficult. You have to be very shrewd, and there's a lot of gray matter in business. There's a lot of areas that may be ethical areas, but may, may not be legal areas. And so many people, I had a, a guy tell me one time, a very wealthy guy, he said, when you're a a multi-millionaire or billionaire it's very likely that you've gotten there because you've had to take advantage of many people not in every case but he said in his experience almost in every case that's that's the issue so this kind of speaks to that mentality he says as far in verse 5 as far as all his enemies he sneers at them in verse 6, he says, he has said in his heart. So this is the wicked, this is his attitude. He says, I shall not be moved. So because of the pride, you see this uh, self-sufficient attitude where they're sort of digging in and they're flexing their muscles and they have this attitude that's similar to uh, Satan's attitude in Isaiah chapter 14 where he says I will ascend to the most high and he goes on the series of I wills and the arrogance and the pride to say that he will exalt himself above God but see that's the same spirit and the same attitude behind a person without thoughts of God they have the, the spirit of the Antichrist. The Bible says there are Antichrists, little Antichrists, running around in this world. And it's the spirit of the Antichrist. The world has a spirit that's against Christ. And so we see here, their attitude is that I will not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Isn't that interesting? So part of their strategy and their goal is to avoid adversity, meaning somebody else imposing their will upon them. Their attitude is, I will impose my will upon others and not the other way around. So they're digging in, they're arrogant, and this is the concern of David that's bothering him. He says, in verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. And notice now, he, he, you get this, he's speaking about specific people, but he also, you can kind of think about how Satan operates too, and sort of a double meaning as far as the, the um, working of Satan and the forces of darkness and evil. In verse 8, it says, He sits lurking in, I'm sorry, He sits in the lurking places of the villages. So that's, that's just really cynical, isn't it? You just get this picture of evil lurking around every corner. And I believe uh, if we were to be able to pull back the veil and see the working of the spiritual forces of darkness. That's how it would be, this sort of sneaky, creepy, uh, lurking around 
attitude of the, the devil and the demons that Ephesians 6 talks about, the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age, lurking. What are they lurking for? They're looking to take advantage. And that shows you how important it is for us to be sober-minded and to be geared towards the things of God. In the book of Ephesians, it says to do all you can to stand. Right? It doesn't, doesn't say just take a little smidgen of a scripture and read it for two seconds and then think you're all covered. He says do everything you can to stand. Just gear your whole attitude towards one, knowing that there's a lurking of evil, but two, knowing where your answer is and your defense is and your strength is, it's in the Lord. Because the Bible says no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Notice in verse 8, the second part, he says, in the secret places, he murders the innocent. That reminds me of abortion. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless, and he lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So it's like he sets up traps. And as he watches and he lurks around, he looks for the vulnerable. And here, of course, he's talking about specific helpless, poor people who have trouble. That's why it's so important for us to be geared towards and oriented to the poor in our heart and our mind in, in helping them. But also, think about being poor or weak in spiritual things. We're like that too. Satan looks to take advantage of us when we are weak and not strong in the things of the Spirit. When we are, in a way, not able to engage in spiritual warfare because we're not able to handle the spiritual weapons. Again, another encouragement, exhortation to be full on into the things of God. And that's, that's our safety. He says in verse 10, So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength, which his strength is more than our strength, but his strength is not more than God's strength. So that's why we can't fight Satan by our own ability and strength. We must fight him by the spiritual weapons of warfare. He says in verse 11, He said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. So their attitude is as if there's no accountability that there's no God, that God is, is either no God or God won't do anything about it. Almost as if he's testing God to do something, daring God. And he's, he's thinking in his mind, and this, this is what happens when wicked people don't turn to the Lord, is that they're just thinking there's no God or doesn't matter I am my own God and I can do whatever I want and my goal and ambition is to get as much as I can and through that I need to take advantage of people if they get in my way. That's the attitude. So now his prayer sort of hinges right here and he says after identifying this and saying, God, I don't see you doing anything about it. Now he, he, he embarks on this pointed prayer now, petitioning God, and he says, Arise, O Lord, with passion. He says, O God, lift up your hand, and do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, You will not require an account. So he's saying, God, look what they're saying, and God, act on that. And notice in verse 14, 
This is where he, he his prayer, this is really good because his prayer transitions from his his anguish over what he's seeing, maybe like many of us, and we see things happening in the world and it troubles us, it's disturbing. But then notice what he says, he prays God, act. And then he says in verse 14, but you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your own hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. And then this is so great. And then he comes back to the sovereignty of God. This is walking by faith and not by sight. Notice what he says. He says, you, in verse 16, or I'm sorry, he says, the Lord is king forever and ever. He said, all that, be that as it may, but he's coming back mentally and he's saying, Lord, you are over everything. You are in control. The nations have perished out of his, hand, his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. See the confidence he had? You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. So he knows God's going to act. This is where his faith comes in. So he's praying and then he ends this prayer with this great confidence in the Lord. So he says in the next chapter, he says, In the Lord I put my trust. What an amazing statement, huh? He says, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? So he's getting pressure. We're not sure exactly what this is, but he's getting pressure to flee. Not in a good way, but to basically to give up, to, to relinquish, to go backwards, to quit. His answer to these people who are telling him that, is that in the Lord I put my trust. So that tells us something. If we put our trust in the Lord, there's never ever any reason to give up, to retreat, to go backwards, to, to flee. We may be in a place where we feel like giving up, where we feel like throwing in the towel. We feel like there's no answer, there, there's no foreseeable solution to our problem. Maybe even getting pressure from people saying, hey, you got to do something else, but you don't have peace about that in your heart. The first thing I would encourage you is to never make a decision based on the mere throwing in the towel or giving up. God will, will always move us forward. He will always progress us. We are to go through the valley of the shadow of death. We are to go through the Red Sea with His help by faith. But there will be great temptations in so many different ways to give up. And I would say just hold on. Actually allow God to work out His plan and be patient through it because the, the riches are really at the end of going through whatever it is you're going through, not in retreating from it. That's a great principle that we find in the Bible. So we face our fears through our faith in the Lord. When we're being tempted to throw in the towel to give up, we have to seek the Lord and say, is this your counsel, God? Because like in the Garden of Gethsemane, they were praying, Peter was praying, but he couldn't handle it. He kept falling asleep. The flesh 
will always quit. The Spirit will always keep going. He said to, to Peter, your, what do you say, your um, flesh, how does it go? The Spirit is willing and your flesh is weak. I like that because the Spirit's always game. The Spirit's always like, yeah, let's go for it. And the flesh is like, oh no, let's give up. The Spirit doesn't give up, the flesh does. It's important to, to know the difference. That's hard sometimes. And when we have to make decisions about things, and we don't know if it's, if it's the Lord's moving us or not, but I, I would encourage you to, to look at whatever you're facing through a biblical lens. And say, is, is God doing something greater? Is He moving me to something higher? Is this a progression or a regression? And that will begin to help us get an answer to, is this really my flesh? Am I just getting tired of this? Am I convincing myself that this is the Lord? Because we're good at that. We can say, oh, you know, I know the Lord wouldn't want me to have to go through all this hard stuff and the Lord's called me to peace and this is really hard. And I, We can reason like that, but I say very, be very careful about that. The Spirit is full on game, full on go for it, let's do it. The flesh is the one telling us to quit. So this is what's happening to David. He says in verse 2, he says, For, for look, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly. There's a lot of this in there, isn't there? Lurking and secret. This word secretly right here literally means in darkness. They may shoot secretly or in darkness at the upright in heart. So that tells you something here too. There's a direct attack from Satan to those who are gods, first of all to those who are Christians because the world hates Jesus. But second of all, there's a direct attack towards those who desire to live a godly life. So when we are saying, Lord, just do whatever you want in my life, I surrender all, and we begin to obey God, even in the hard things, then it's like Satan's back there with his arrows and he's shooting those flaming darts at us. That's why it's so important to have our shield of faith up. So he's recognized that. He does have the shield of faith up, right? Because he said, I put my trust in the Lord. Those, those enemies, they're ready, ready. Their bows are ready to go. And they're aimed at me, but I'm trusting in the Lord. He says in verse 3, he says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Basically, what he, he's seen his environment around him crumble. He's seen society fall. He's seen the nation of Israel uh, have difficulties and surrounded by their enemies. And he, he's saying when, when that's destroyed, what can the righteous do? Have you, ever, you know how, how we feel like, you know, if you walks, watch Fox News for 10 hours and you're like, man, oh, wow, we're, I can't do anything. We're, we're just in big trouble. It, there definitely is a direction that our country is going. But don't forget the Lord. Don't forget that. So he puts our leadership in place. He puts our presidents in place. He tells us to pray for them, respect their office. He tells us that we, in and of ourselves, should be concerned about being lights in a dark world. We should be concerned about being salt, about loving our enemies and overcoming evil with what? The tea party? Overcoming evil with good. That's how we overcome evil. And I'm not saying we're not to participate in the, uh, the way our country has given us the opportunity to be part of the process. We should do that. That's our responsibility. But I'm saying ultimately, we look to the Lord. Ultimately, we trust in the Lord. Ultimately, we pray. We ask God to move. And 
we don't let anything interfere with our being lights of the world. That's what's most important. It is really easy, and I think Satan wants us to get really caught up in the ugliness sometimes of politics. And we're really good at taking shots at people. In reality, we have to be really careful because God says we're to honor and respect those that are put in authority. So we get involved in the process. But ultimately, we understand there's something much greater going on here. There's a bigger thing going on here. And so God is sovereign. He's in control. He's not surprised anything's happening. But we have to make sure that we're walking in the light and that our lives are strong in the Lord. That's what's important. So he says in verse 4, he said, he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Do you see what he does? Everything's falling apart. What can a little guy like me do? And he's like, oh, wait, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. So you see, now he's having faith. He's, he's seen the situation, and then he's having faith. His eyes behold his eyelids test the sons of men. But the Lord, notice this, the Lord tests the righteous. That's interesting, isn't it? So could it be that the foundations that are crumbling all around us, that in that we are being tested too? How are we responding according to the way Jesus responded? Are we responding in love, in faith, in trust, in strength in God? Are we putting on the full armor of God? Are we overcoming evil with good? Are we loving our enemies? Are we blessing those who persecute us? All that kind of stuff. Because, yeah, what we see, it really is happening. It really is going the wrong direction from what we would like it to go. But hey, what if, as we often see and have seen throughout history, that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And maybe God is allowing situations so that people can see their real need for God. Because when things are really good, it's hard to see our need for God, isn't it? And why is it that persecution seems to be the seed of the church? When the church is persecuted, the church is better. When society is more adverse to Christianity, Christianity is stronger. So that's important to note. We can't forget that. So he says... Maybe, maybe we're being tested. Maybe we're putting, being put in positions where we have to trust the Lord. In Isaiah 6, when King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. Do you remember that? In the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah did great things for Israel. Israel was great with him as king. When he died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. And maybe when things in our society that people put their false hope and trust in die, that's when they'll start seeing the Lord. In verse 6, or oh, I'm sorry, second part of 5, he says, Who loves violence, his soul hates. The wicked who love violence, God hates that. Upon the wicked, he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, He loves righteousness, and His countenance beholds the upright. So chapter 12, he says one of the greatest prayers in the Bible, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases or stops. 
So here he's he's again troubled by what he's seeing, and this this is probably a lot a lot of the way we feel. It it seems like the the godly seem to be more few and far between those who seem to really love the Lord and see it as important to to die to themselves, to deny themselves, take up the cross and follow the Lord. It, it when when we see that that sort of being so rare, it's very concerning. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, help. He says, for the faithful disappear from the among, among the sons of men. They, they speak idly, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. So more on the wicked and the attitude of the world... Now he, he speaks more about, about what they say, about their speech and the way they talk. He says in verse 3, he says, May the Lord cut off all the flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things, who have said, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? And man, I, I just, you know, um, the Bible tells us that the sin of Sodom was pride. That was the main sin of Sodom. And so you see the parallels here when we look at our country and we look at the Bible, we look at Israel, we look at the, the nations uh, throughout history, and we, we see these very similar things that more than anything, pride kills a nation. He's noticing that. He's noticing this, this arrogance of people who, will, who would say, we don't need God anymore. We've got it figured out. God is a relic from the past. We're more advanced now. And so now by our wisdom, by our understanding, we can be successful and we can have a society where we don't have to be accountable for, to God. Ultimately, that is what the heart is behind all rejection of God. It's man, a man who rejects God is one who doesn't want authority over their life. They don't want to have to be accountable to anybody or anything. And so they create schemes and theories and philosophies to try to escape God. The folly of that. In verse 5, he says, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord, and I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace, of earth purified seven times that's one of my favorite verses in the bible because man says a lot of things doesn't he and we think that that we become we can become so sophisticated and there's this alarming trend that's been going on for quite a while that's, that says we don't need to hear the words of God as much because they're not relevant. Because people today are not interested. You can't teach the Bible. People won't come to church. And the Bible, God's Word, God's written Word, is the most relevant thing in the world because it will never pass away. Man's words pass away. Do you remember the philosopher Voltaire? He said he would single-handedly eradicate Christianity in 20 years. He said that. And the house that he lived in 20 years later was a house where they began printing Bibles to send out throughout the whole world. Let God's word be true and every man a liar. And you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a shame to reject God because of some theory or something somebody said or some philosophy that somebody had 
that years later you found to be incorrect, proven incorrect. And that's what's going to happen. But see, the heart of that is, uh, is not wanting accountability to God, and that heart will search out for these readily available philosophies that will give them an excuse to deny God. But interestingly, how God's Word, it says it's, it's purified, it's tested. I love that. That God's Word will never fail. God's Word will always stand. God's Word has so much for the human soul that it's our very spiritual food. God's Word is our spiritual food. And I believe that's so important in our day and age where outside of God's truth, Things are becoming so convoluted, distorted, confusing, and hard to understand that we come back to God's Word now, we find meaning, we find truth, we find understanding, we find grounding, we find God Himself. So when this starts, when God's Word starts to diminish up here or in the, in the pulpits, that's when leaven has gotten so far down into a society where now it's affecting the institution which is supposed to be a light-bearing institution to the glory of God. He's given us His, his Word to know Him and to grow in Him and to share. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, if nobody ever shows up again because of this, then I'll, I would be the last one just walking out with this in my hand. And I know that's why you guys come here. Because it doesn't matter what anybody says, does it? doesn't matter what the world says. doesn't matter what they think. We are to impact our world. They are not to dictate to us what we do. It's supposed to be the opposite. We're not to be a thermometer. We're to be a thermostat. And the only way that happens is if we live our life according to God's Word, which is His truth. In verse 7, He says, You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. I love that. The wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Chapter 13. Now he says, How long, Lord? He repeats this. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? So do you, do you sense this? He's, he's like, before God a lot. And he's pouring his heart out. He's praying passionately. He's not afraid to pray about the things that concern him. And he's got a lot on his heart. And you know, it's interesting, the more we go to God in prayer, the more full our heart is. The more we have things to say and to dialogue with God about, He fills our heart but notice what's interesting. Because David spends so much time before God, he feels the same way God feels about things in many cases. He thinks in many cases the way God thinks. So he, he's reflecting his heart, his concern about society, about the wicked, about the poor. These are all things that God feels. And so... He's, he's an extension of God. And that's how it is when, when we are before God in prayer, dialoguing, praying, interceding, casting our cares upon Him, talking to Him. He, he's talking back and we begin to develop this relationship that's a, a relationship where, where we have a heart and a mind that God has. So he says, how long will you hide your face from me? So we kind of see that again. So this was kind of a struggle for him, wasn't it? Verse 2, how long shall I take counsel 
in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Saying, Lord, help, help me to see things like you do. Help me to understand. He's, he's praying that God would show him the way. And you get this, this sense that he had experienced so much intimacy and closeness with God. That, that one little movement of God away from that, so David's faith would be built, was alarming to him. His description, being a man after God's own heart, I believe had much to do with his time spent with the Lord, that he was, he was really after God's heart, and that gave him a heart, for God, and then he reflected the things of God in his prayers and in the things that he said, as we spoke about before. But he's he's so concerned about his his closeness and intimacy with God. He says in verse four. He says, "Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice." When I am moved. So now he's saying, Lord, now that I'm your responsibility, move on my behalf so your name wouldn't be shamed, so your name wouldn't be discredited. In verse 5, but, but I have trusted in your mercy. Do you see that hinge now? He's praying, he's pouring out his heart, and then, like we saw before, he comes to the end, he says, Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm trusting in you. I, I know that you're now over, over all this reigning supreme. And guys, I think that's really important. It's really important when we pray not to just think that the, the actual act of praying in and of itself is the answer, but it's the trusting in God that's the answer, that we're praying, we know He hears us, we know He's going to act, we know He's in control, and we're trusting in that. Don't make that mistake. And don't think, oh, I stayed up all night and prayed and I still feel the same. I'm just a little more tired. I stayed up all night and prayed and I, I gave all my cares to God and I believe God is in control and now I'm walking away a free man because now it's, it's all His now. See, that is so important. We have to, at some point, it's not just the doing of all this stuff, it's the believing of all that stuff. That is so crucial. And so now he's doing that. He said, but I have trusted in your mercy. And now what happens when we do that? My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Now I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Isn't that great? And then the last short chapter. He says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Now, he's not talking about someone who, who can't know that there is no God. It's about somebody who won't know that there is God. It's a big difference, isn't there? Don't be fooled by these people who will come to you with their various intellectual discussions about how God doesn't exist because that's not really the problem. The problem is sin. The fool says in his heart, in Romans 1, you might want to read through 18 through the end of the chapter, it speaks about this. It speaks about someone who suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Hey, I want to party. Hey, I want to do my thing. I, I don't want all this confinement and restriction, which I don't really understand that they are in bondage to sin. That's what Satan tricks people. 
Like, this is real freedom. No, you're in bondage to sin. So a fool is one who says, notice, in their heart. Not in their mind, their heart. They're saying, I don't want God. There's no God. He says they are corrupt. Well, obviously, that you have to be corrupt if you're saying there's no God because all goodness comes from God, doesn't it? So if you're rejecting the source of all goodness, then you're rejecting any good and basically you're left to your own sin. He said they have done abominable works. And then he says there is none who does good. So now he's sort of painting a, a picture of all of mankind. He, he, was, he was talking about people who say there's no, no God, but then now he's giving a general picture of the human race. He says there's none who really do good. And Romans uh, chapter 3 picks up on this, chapter 12. He says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. And so we have the condition of mankind. Isn't that interesting? Because don't you think most people think they're good? No matter how bad they are, they have some way of convincing themselves they're a really good person. Isn't that wild? If you ever get a chance, watch some of the uh, YouTube videos on uh, Ray Comfort goes out and interviews people living waters ministry and and it's really, he goes out and interviews people. and every, Well, I'm sure he, there's some people that say they're good, but they, everybody says, oh, I'm basically a good person, you know, basically. The Bible says, no, there's none that are good. Not one. None of us are good. That's why we need the grace of God, right? He says in verse 4, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord. Now isn't that interesting that we see that right before our eyes. We see Christians, one, in other parts of the world actually getting slaughtered for their faith. In our country... Christians are being slaughtered in other ways, not physically, but in other ways. Verbally, we're being attacked. Verbally, we're being discounted. We're being put off. We're being written out of society. This is nothing new. The world hates Jesus, and if they hated him, how are they going to feel about you and I? Not really good. So that's why we have to understand the world is going to hate us. And the Bible tells us to be really, really, be cautious of the world thinks you're awesome and they speak very well of you and the world loves you and it's your, you're its darling. There's something wrong probably. Because if you live a life of faith in Jesus Christ, the world's going to hate you. So he says in verse 5, There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. I pray that this younger generation will be that generation. Don't you? I don't want to be a pessimist. It's not looking really good. But God, right, He's bigger. So you who are graduating from high school, Taylor, right, Jacob, anybody else graduating? Joseph, our recent graduates, Zach and Alex. Anybody else recently graduate? No. Listen, guys, 
Listen to this. Verse 5 again, For God is with the generation of the righteous. See, He's not going to be with the generation that has a false righteousness or a pseudo-faith or a worldly Christianity or a Christianity that we call relevant, but it's just really sinful. God is with the generation that says, God, I'm willing to deny myself and take up my cross and follow you. That's who God is with. Oh, Michael, there he is. Yeah. Don't forget, Michael's graduating too. Guys, you got to pray for your generation because the previous generation, it's kind of my generation, messed it all up for you. <laughs> so, so you got to get it back. But don't make any mistake. God is going to be with that righteous generation. Verse 6, You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is His refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. So he's finishing this prayer. We're going to end right here. And he's saying, Lord, make everything right. And he's saying it with this confidence that he knows one day it will be right. And Zion was where God revealed his, uh, his presence and his protection and his promises. And he's saying, saying God... Come out of Zion again. He says, When the Lord brings back the captivity of His people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. And so he finishes off again with this great encouragement. And he says, Regardless of what's going on around us, it's the Lord that we can build our life on and we have that promise that if we will build our life on the rock of Jesus Christ, we will never be moved. Everything will be crumbled around us, not us. So don't freak out about everything. See what's going on. Pray over it. And ultimately, there has to come a place where the body of Christ starts being disobedient. There has to come a place where it's, it's not about just learning more, and it's not about studying more, and it's not about reading more. At some point, we just have to start being obedient. And when we start obeying the Lord, so the power of God will work through our lives in such a dramatic way that we will be altered and that world who is so in desperate need of Jesus Christ, they're going to see in us that light that shines so brightly, the light of Jesus Christ. And that's the hope of our world. That's the only hope. And so let's, let's pray that God will do a great move before he comes back for the church. Wouldn't that be great? Let's pray.